Hello again, welcome. And here we're to talk about hops. Everybody loves hops. Hops are the soul of the beer. Depending on who you talk to. Maybe malt's the soul of the beer if you really like malty beers. But hops, they are the sexy part of beer. Can't deny that. So, of course, hops, humulus, lupus, I'm sure you've covered this in materials evaluation with Joey. Uh, perennial plant grows with vertical binds, not vines. Vines use tendrils to grab binds, use sticky hairs to grab on. Uh, grow in a clockwise fashion, chasing the sun as it goes. So the part that we're interested in as brewers is the cone or the flower of the female plant only. Currently there are roughly 80 or so varietals and since there is such a huge demand for hops and, and different flavors from hops they are constantly being researched, bred, and grown and that's why you'll see more and more trademarked or registered or proprietary hops and they're the little r above the name as they're, as they're grown <clears throat> as we see more and more proprietary varietals come out. So the hops growing regions, North America, Europe, the continent, and the British Isles. Uh, South Africa is kind of an emerging market. You'll see African Queen is kind of the only one I've seen personally. Uh, New Zealand and Australia are producing some very interesting hops in general. It's a very, very fruity, wonderful stuff. <clears throat> So you can see this is the finished product that most brewers are going to be using, hops pellets. If you haven't seen those yet, I'm sure you have. You've, you've, you've brewed at least at the college, if not on any other time. You're going to use hops, and this is what they look like, especially on a home brewer level, unless you grow them yourself, or if you use whole cone or fresh hops. Uh, not a lot of people do. Although, if you go to Sierra Nevada, you'll never find anything like this at their place. They use whole cone, and they're famous for it. So here you find myself and my other brewer, Matt. We are in a hop farm in just south of Paducah, picking out some fresh hops that we were going to use in the next day or so. Uh, this was from, I think, about three years ago. As you can see here, the little hop cone, depending on the varietal, it can range from about an inch to inch and a half to three or four inches long. <clears throat> and they grow on these vines just like that with some side arms and tendrils popping out. See a sidearm popping out with a little bit of hop cone there. And this is a smaller operation. I don't believe he's growing anymore. Uh, he had a lot of issues with pests. But this is what his hop farm looked like. The commercial ones in the Pacific Northwest are hundreds, if not thousands, of acres that look a little, little tighter than this together. And it's just amazing. And you look down the row and it's just a curtain of hops. So the main components of hops that we're worried about as brewers are alpha acids, beta acids, and essential hop oils. So what we've got here is one of the alpha acids. This is humulum, to give you an idea of the chemical structure of it there. So alpha acids, you've got humulum when it's boiled. It isomerizes to cis isohumulone. Adhumulone, when boiled, isomerizes to cis isoadhumulone. Uh, Cohumulone, a little less important. And the isomerized alpha acids contribute almost wholly to the bitterness of beer. And I say almost wholly because there are some other things that contribute to bitterness. Let's look at the, the roasted flavors of a stout, by the way. They, they do contribute to the overall perceived bitterness of the beer. So you really have to take that into account when judging your bitterness on, on those kinds of beers. But for the most part, bitterness is going to come from the hops. Specifically, isomerized alpha acids. Uh, beta acids, I don't know what happened here, but that's supposed to be a, a capital beta. Thanks a lot, Google Slides. Contributes nearly nothing to bitterness. Not nearly as important. The, the thinking used to be that if you had a low ratio of alpha acids to beta acids, your 
bitterness was not nearly as harsh. That's been thrown out the window. So, not nearly as important as we once thought. We're not going to cover it. So, essential hop oil is really where the, the rubber meets the pavement here. So, it only makes up 0.1 to 2% of the dry weight total of, of hops. But, it has the largest impact on flavor and aroma. In my opinion, some people might not think so, but it's hard to argue with the facts here. And essential oils is divided into three groups. The hydrocarbon component, the oxygenated component, and the sulfur-containing component. And three very important things. So important, we're going to talk about them. So, the hydrocarbon component. Hydrocarbon, we've all taken organic chemistry. <coughs> you know in general what that word means. So, sesquiterpenes, so we're going to look at beta farnesine, alpha humulene, and beta carophylline. So they're going to contribute, for the most part, just a spicy, spicy vegetable, spicy uh, floral, herbal spiciness. Uh, not quite like pepper or, or uh, like jalapeno spiciness. I'll think of that word in a second. But it's just a, it's, it's an, an ester spicy. Monoterpenes, so like myrcene, alpha pinene, beta pinene. They're going to do a spicy, herbal, green, hop, general smell and flavor and aroma. These all are very particularly volatile, which means they are going to boil out during the boil. So, dry hopping, that's where you're going to pick up a lot of your hydrocarbon component. Some will still be around from later additions in the boil, and if you do, an extended whirlpool, if you reduce your temperature under whirlpool, you're going to save a fair amount of these, uh, particularly if you're getting close to 180 in the boil. Seems to be a little bit of a magic number. It really, that also changes based on some research. Uh, between 200 and 180 is really one of, for a whirlpool stand where you want to be, and you can let that free fall by itself, adding the hops throughout multiple times during that stand, depending on what you're doing. So what we've got here is the chemical structure of myrcene. Not a fairly complicated chemical compound, but very important. Got some in this beer right here. It's a dry hopped IPA. <clears throat> so, myrcene. Green, herbaceous, resinous aroma associated with that fresh hop smell or aroma. So. You crack open a, a fresh bag of hops, that first whiff you're going to get, you're going to recognize that hops smell. And that's, for the most part, mercy. That's one of the largest components. Uh, like I said, up to 50% or more of the oil content. Uh, specifically, Cascade having one of the highest concentrations of mercy of, of all the hops. So, when you dry hop with Cascade, I very much recommend using it as a dry hop that's where you're going to get a lot of its potential for, dry, for, for flavoring and aroma in general. <clears throat> a lot of it's going to be from mercine. Some people don't like that green. What's wrong with it? And like I said, it only survives in the finished beer. Try not to use absolutes. Some of it can survive with a late addition in the boil or with whirlpool, but for the most part, Specifically, it's going to be from dry hopping contributions. <clears throat> the oxygenated component are <clears throat> oxidized, which just means oxygen modified components of a majority of the hydrocarbon components. So, uh, hemiterpene alcohols, 3 methyl 2 butene, 1 all. Alcohol, when it ends, a compound ends in OL, means it has an ox alcohol component somewhere on that molecule. So 3-methyl-2-butene-1-all, fruity, citrus, uh, the monoterpene alcohols, linalool, geninol, and beta citronellol. Very important, very floral, uh, fruity, citrus, lemon, lime, just citrus in general. Uh, sesquiterpene alcohols like cumulinol, ferret, uh, Farnesenol, 
We saw that on the sesquiterpenes, the humulene, farnesine, terophylline. When they are oxygenated, they become part of the oxygen component and they change slightly uh, how they're perceived. Uh, also, they change in their solubility. Significantly soluble relative to the hydrocarbon component. <clears throat> so, one could say that the hydrocarbon component does become soluble, but only after it is oxidized. So, humulinol, farnesinol is very herbal, very fragrant. Others are going to be aldehydes, ketones, esters, or epoxides. That's just going to be a generic potential fusel like, solvent like flavor or aroma. Also, just kind of fruity and sweet, kind of like alcohol in general. <coughs> so, the oxygenated component is really one of the most impactful components when we're talking about IPA brewing. <clears throat> Specifically, the monoterpene alcohols. And that's going to be... A lot of the research is showing that it, it's just not nearly as cut and dry as it used to be. And we'll get to that in just a second. But, so the increased boil times may increase the concentration of these components through oxidation reactions of hydrocarbon components. So. I used to be under the idea that if you wanted to punch you in the face, hop aroma and flavor, everything had to go at the end of the boil or a whirlpool. And the research just doesn't coincide with that completely. You need to have some larger boil component to introduce this oxygen component to create it, to solubilize it. It just, it's, it's got to be there. It's, it, if you don't, you're, you're losing some of your roundness of hop, flavor, and aroma. <clears throat> so that's through monoterpenes and sesquiterpene reactions that are oxidized. So instead, like I said, instead of late additions, additions between 30 and 10 minutes, if we're thinking backwards. And it might take multiple additions, you know, 30, 20, 10, 5, 0, or 30, 25, 20, 15, 10. The more you think about the 60 minute dogfish and how constant they're adding hops throughout and how complex and rounded the flavor of that, that hop component of that beer is. It's a prime example of the oxygenated, oxygenated component in my opinion. So linalool or linalool, depending if you want to pronounce it incorrectly, but the OL is always pronounced all, so linalool. Once known as a marker for high hoppy aroma, like that's what they used to measure. Like you got a hop, it's got a high linalool component, it's hoppy. It's going to be a major, major contributor to hoppiness or, or aroma and flavor. The relationship, as we, we've come to find out, is a lot more complex than that. There's no single marker for measurement of hoppiness of a hop. It's, it's way too much in, lost in the conglomeration of everything that's there. So linalool's got a floral and orange, orange aromas. Geraniol, floral and rose. Not as much as phenol, but there's a little bit of rose. Uh, particularly, some things like Geranile, they're biotransformed into something else completely. And this one, geranile, is biotransformed by yeast into beta citronella. And citronella all might ring a bell from citronella candles. You've got a very uh, pine, fruity, citrusy smell. Just if you think about a citronella candle, maybe not as much as the harsh solvent like smell you get from citronella. <clears throat> More of the positive attributes. So, I've got here quoted lemon lime. Yeah, that can happen, but it's more, you, you get a little bit of pine, you get a bit of fruity citrus in general. So geranile, again, it used to be evaluated in combination with linalool. There used to be ideas about ratios between the two. Uh, a lot more complex than that. It, it, the research is showing that it's just not as cut and dry. You can't measure one ingredient and decide whether or not that hop's going to be good or not. Uh, 
geranile can also be found in coriander. So you have the potential there to introduce an exogenous source of geranile to affect the overall concentration and change your hop flavor and aroma just by using a, a spice. I've done this in home brewing and there was a little bit of a difference, you know, the, the hop aroma, the, the fruity citrus was a little more in your face. I haven't done it yet on a commercial basis and that might be something good for us to try with the, the brewing at the college. That might be an interesting thing to do. I'll have to talk to Mike about that. This is Geranile. Uh, look how similar it is to the Myrcene. your beer, it doesn't work. <clears throat> this is linalool. wall. So the last component of hops, essential oils, is the sulfur containing component. And for this to be less than 1% of a hops total oil content, it has a huge impact on flavor and aroma threshold because of the low thresholds that these compounds have. You know, we'll talk about it, but it is an extremely low amount that needs to be present in order for us as humans to perceive it. <clears throat> so thiols are released from hops by an enzyme produced by yeast called beta lions. And these thiols include 3 mercaptohexin 1-all 3-MH, 3 mercaptohexin lacetate 3-MHA, 3 mercaptor 4 methyl pentam 1-all 3-M4-MP, and one of the more studied ones, uh, 4 mercaptor 4 methyl pentin 2 ohm or 4 MMP. Uh, so 4 MMP has got a black currant flavor. The flavor threshold on 4 MMP is 0 0.00055 parts per billion. Fractions upon fractions of a part per billion. <laughs> it's what, 0.5 part per trillion ish? doing my math somewhat correct. I don't know, I've had a couple of beers and so I may not be close to it. <clears throat> Extremely small amounts can affect the flavor and aroma of the beer. Uh, 3MH, you got grapefruit, gooseberry, guava, just wonderful tropical fruits. Uh, flavor threshold, 0 0.06 parts per billion. <clears throat> and it can also can be converted to 3MHA, which has a passion fruit-like aroma. So it just complex flavors from, you know, a drop in the ocean. <clears throat> and we've got here 4-MMP. The thiol is this right here, kind of like alcohol, but instead of oxygen, it's sulfur. <clears throat> and I believe I said this before, but sulfur-containing components, we are hardwired to be able to sense them in very low concentrations, because they're typically associated with rotten or decaying matter. It just Typically we don't want anything to do with sulfur containing products because when we were evolving that was bad stuff. Don't eat that. It smells like crap. It is crap. But we see an unintended consequence. We've got a thiol here that in very small amounts is very pleasing. Sulfur containing component like I said here, not always great. We've got the light struck or skunk flavor. Uh, for those people that don't live in North America and don't have skunks, they describe it as coffee. You know, if you sometimes have a skunky flavor when you make some particularly uh, fragrant coffee, similar, similar issue here. But people outside of North America don't know skunks. They don't have skunks, so they don't know that it's bad. It smells like coffee to them. So you've got it, people think that uh, bringing beer from cold to hot to cold multiple times skunks it. Like, no, that, that's not an issue. Skunking flavor comes from ultraviolet exposure. So light, sunlight is a huge source of ultraviolet. Uh, LED lighting that we've got here in the brewery is a source of ultraviolet. Not nearly as bad as the sun, but 
traditional incandescent lighting doesn't have nearly as much ultraviolet, but it can happen. So the ultraviolet light causes the formation of 3-methyl-2-butene-1-thiol, or MBT, from isohumulone. So isohumulone, as we go back, that's an isomerized alpha acid. It's in hops, it's in beer. You expose beer to light, this is going to happen. Unless you're like Miller and you use a hop product that doesn't contain humulone, which is why their champagne of beer is in a clear bottle and you don't get any skunk from it. <clears throat> or you could be like Rolling Rock and just own it, make it part of your flavor. Anyway, so the MBT has a flavor threshold of around four parts per trillion. Yes, trillion. Very small amount. Uh, and I can tell you from experience we've done here at Henderson Brewing Company that it takes almost time, no time at all for this to occur. Uh, so we poured our Bohemia Pilsner, sheltered it with our shirt, brought it out, and exposed it to sunlight in varying amounts of time. Covered it up, brought it back inside, and did some taste tests. And we found it took as little as two seconds exposed to sunlight to cause a very slight skunk flavor. Now that possibly was because our trained palates can pick it up. Probably not as quick as that for the general public. Uh, but definitely, you know, we get out to 10, 15, 30 seconds in sunlight and you can get a, a significant skunk flavor. Now that is in a Bohemian Pilsner. As far as in general, it's it's more heavily hopped than say an American light lager, but not like an IPA. Uh, IPA is going to have all kinds of stuff for that to hide under. You know, but if you let it sit out long enough, it's just going to become a skunk bomb. Or if you package your beer in bottles, brown for God's sake, brown. Don't use anything other than brown. Uh, if you can't, green's better than clear. Clear is the worst choice ever you could possibly make for packaging a beer. Uh, unless you use a hop product that doesn't have humulone, like uh, the aforementioned Miller. I don't want to do that. We, When we bottled, we did brown. We did our Saison and green, because that was the only champagne bottle option to us. But we do our best to make sure we don't really expose it to light. Uh, but there's a whole lot of stuff in that Saison to hide on. You've got all the esters from the yeast, and we also aged it on oak. So really, the oak covers up anything that might be there from the potential UV exposure from the green bottle. But, uh, less than ideal. So another component, polyphenols, very a small component of hops, but a realistic contributor. So when present in combination with isomerized alpha acids, so you're always going to have that, you should, unless you're making a gruit, it may produce a harsh bitterness. Uh, for the most part, the majority of the polyphenols that are found in a finished product beer are going to be from malt. But the polyphenols that are contributed by hops are different in structure than the polyphenols uh, from malt. And the polyphenols that are contributed by hops specifically interact with alpha acids to cause that harsh bitterness. So what do you do? You find a hop that has the lowest content of polyphenols to bitter with. And as far as I know, that is Hollertal Magnum, or Magnum in general. I believe it's 2.6 milligrams per liter. The number 2.6 is correct. I don't remember the units 100%. I think it's milligrams per liter, but uh, no, 2.6% weight per weight uh, of the essential oil. Polyphenol content in magnum is low. That said, <clears throat> 100 IBUs bittered with magnum is wholly and completely different than 100 IBUs bittered with. Columbus, or CTZ, Zeus, or Bravo, or some of the higher polyphenol content, where you think about a, if you've ever had a stone ruination, which was 
100 plus IBU beer, it will rip the varnish off of an old coffee table if you've got it. It is harsh bitterness. It is 100 IBUs of punch you in the face stone bitterness. We made a double IPA here that was calculated, estimated at 100, 105 IBUs. It was mellow, it was balanced, it was great. In my opinion, low polyphenol concentrating hops are the ideal way to bitter, unless you're really looking for that harsh bitterness. Uh, then there's ways to get it. You, know, you use your, an early edition of a, of a different flavor and hop that you've got on, on in inventory. Uh, but in my opinion, if you want a, a mellow bitterness, go for a hop that has a lower polyphenol kind of concentration. And for the most part, it is more contributed during dry hopping. But it makes a huge difference in your bittering hop choice. Because if you bitter with Columbus, calculate it out to the exact same IBUs if you bitter with Magnum, it's a completely different beer. So synergy, when talking about these flavor active compounds, number one, we're going to talk about the, the fact of synergy of flavors caused by lowering the flavor threshold. If you got one flavor, let's say its flavor threshold is 25 parts per million, <clears throat> you combine it with another chemical compound, all of a sudden, both of their flavor thresholds are lowered than what their flavor thresholds would be uh, by themselves alone. Uh, and that's synergy, and that's the way flavors work. They, they, they combine together, they interact with our olfactory senses, and they become a conglomeration of each other. So really, synergy, there is not one component of these hop compounds that is alone responsible for flavor and aroma contribution. It's just, it's way too compli complicated to say, this has a ton of myrcene, let's do that based only on that. Unless you want that specific myrcene flavor, then you can get it. But in general, if you want that hoppy flavor, that hoppy aroma, it's a conglomeration of all of the compounds that occur naturally in the lupulin glands. So the research that's been done on hops compounds, the goal of research is to try to simpl simplify things. And the more we research hops and the compounds that are contributed, the more we realize that it is not simple. It, it just won't be because of the multitude of compounds that interact with each other, that interact with our brains differently when they're in combination with each other. And the ratios of that combination can make a difference as well. It's just a lot more complicated than it is. All right. If uh, you don't have it yet, I highly recommend this book here from Scott Janish, uh, New IPA Scientific Guide to Hop Aroma and Flavor. It's specifically talking about New England IPAs, but the research and the information that's presented is important to every brewer, in my opinion especially if you want to make a, a good New England IPA, but if you remove that filter, the research that is presented is important across the board in every style. So I highly recommend it. I didn't make it required because it's so narrow with regards to this class. Thank you.